Did the shows that we high dramas are presently give us any laughter? In the new revival of Noel Coward's Present Laughter, Kevin Klein stars as Gary Essendine, an aging matinee idol who's still super handsome enough to be remarkably attractive to young women like Daphne, Tedra Millian, who loses her, forgets her latchkey. This becomes a problem because he's always getting involved with the wrong people. And his um, secretary, Christine Nelson, and his ex-wife, or estranged wife, Kate Burton, try to help him save the day, as do other people around him. But there's one very sneaky, snaky, sexy wife of a uh, partner, played by um, Kobe Co Smulders. Smulders, who might be the final monkey wrench in the works here. And all the while, he's trying to get ready for this tour in Africa. <laughs> and, 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 the, I mean, and he's like hoping to escape from all these people. And it's like, he just attracts people. He's like a moth to a flame, mm -hmm. and he's the flame. And he's just, and is he flaming? I mean, not gay or anything, but just uh, with his dinner jackets and his, you know, and his uh, chef affair, and, and it's directed. He's always on stage, and, and he's always primping. And it's directed by our favorite person in the world, Moritz von Stupnagel. Who gets every laugh out of I, this. I mean, this guy is a master of comic direction. And it's just so... Del and it's Noel Coward. And it's so much fun and delightful. Yeah. And, and, and it, it has aged beautifully just like Mr. s &D. And the cast <laughs> is just phenomenal. <laughs> Everything about this is just perfect and wonderful and delightful. And you will have not just present laughter, but future laughter thinking about it. Leslie DeLeo and I saw Amelie. It's based on this French film that we just, this delightful film called, uh. and it's directed by Pam McKinnon. Look it, he didn't see it. This is not Mark Savitz kind of show, so don't even listen to his grunts and groans and eye rolling because he doesn't count in this. This show is aimed for people like me and Leslie, and you'll find a much longer review for uh, both of us on the Facebook page. But this is our truncated version because we both loved it and want you to know about it. It's a sweet confection of a musical about a hyper-imaginative girl-young woman whose flights of fancy and acts of kindness allow her to live in her head while eventually connecting her to the people around her. She's homeschooled outside parents by her eccentric parents who seem extremely uncomfortable around children. Kind of makes you think of Matilda. One of the show's strengths is a manifestation of Amelie's world using oversized, sometimes comical puppets as characters. Emily finds a child's box from her previous tenants and decides to track the box owner and return it. Along her travels, she meets another quixotic character who collects photo booth pictures. Her neighbor, a reclusive artist, also enters her world, encouraging her newfound romance. Philip Sue as Emily is charming and peppy, and her unique, strong, and sweet voice echoes with hope and longing. Randy Blair is hilarious as a musical takeoff of a rock star, most certainly Elton John, and the whole cast is engaging and quirky in a good way. Savvy Crawford is adorable as a young Emily. The lyrics are clever and the music is enjoyable. With no intermission, Emily is just the right length for this imaginative, feel-good musical. It's not long on plot, but it is charming with a talented cast, director, and production team. Clearly a labor of love. Emily is a bonbon that you'll thoroughly enjoy, and she especially likes the appropriately titled Times Are Hard for Dreamers. And we are both giving this a happy, 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 happy face. Oh, I forgot to mention the most important thing of all, that uh, her love interest was played by Adam Chandler Barrett, and the artist was Tony Sheldon. And Heath Calvert, one of my favorites, he plays an important part in it as the mysterious man. So, like I said, great cast, great show, great everything. We loved it. Indecent is really a very amazing play. It deals with Shalom Ash, who in 1907 wrote this incredible play, God of Vengeance, which was written in Yiddish and presented a story about a family led by a father who runs a brothel below his house. And he wants to keep in the home above his young daughter very pure, 
but she falls in love with one of the prostitutes. It was amazing for being so ahead of its time in presenting a fairly positive lesbian scene of the two women um, kind of embracing each other and loving each other in the rain. But when it was shown in New York on Broadway, changes had to be made, according to the producers, which really made the play more salacious and ugly, and the cast didn't like it. It's very much about the performers who stuck with this material through the years, including the awful years of World War II. Yeah, and, um, and yeah, it's interesting that young Sholem Ash passionately fought to get his play done, knowing it would be the greatest play ever written, while the older Ash washed his hands of it and preferred his poems and novels and lost his passion along the way. Rebecca Teichman has directed this potent play with an incredible ensemble of actors, including the actors already mentioned, and Steven Rattazzi and Mimi Lieber, who swiftly changed from actors in God Adventures to their real-life characters, actors being actors in double duty and double the talent. Everything about this play is perfection, even the title. Well, it really deals with the whole uh, Jewish experience, oh, wait, especially Mimi. as immigrants in the 20th century. Oh, Mimi Lieber isn't in it anymore. I don't know who oh, took okay. Mimi Lieber's play. So this is from an old review that we did um, from, from Off-Broadway. But, um, but also Tom Nellis was really incredible. And we especially liked uh, Katrina Lank. She is... Gorgeous woman. Yes. It's just... Um, it's just hard, and Paula Vogel has written this incredible, incredible play. Yeah, it's it's very complex and totally engaging, and you'll love the musical numbers, you'll find a lot of comedy, but you will be deeply, deeply moved and probably I mean, in tears I mean, at the, many oh, points. Yeah, the opening, closing image will just knock your socks off. It's just, this is an amazing, brilliant, wonderful terrific play and you really should catch it. Look, we agree on this. Yes, that's amazing in itself. Irish Rep is reviving Eugene O'Neill's early play, The Emperor Jones, directed by Sharon O'Reilly, and it's a very expressionist tale about an a American black guy who was a porter but now is the emperor of some unnamed Caribbean island. He's been exploiting the people and getting as much money out of them as he can, but now his henchman, who's a white guy, tells him the people have deserted the palace and they're playing tom-toms. It's time to escape and try to get out of here as fast as you can. While trying to escape through the jungle, Emperor Jones is attacked by all sorts of hallucinatory dreams based on his past, and it's very expressionistically done with puppets and extreme lighting. And it's amazingly ahead of its time about dealing with the position of black men in society, how they're oppressed, and how if some of them get a chance, they'll gleefully oppress their fellow men. Um, really good production of an important early Eugene O'Neill play. Try to see it. I'm giving it a happy face. Soho Rep is presenting Richard Maxwell's Samara, directed by Sarah Benson, with original music by Stephen Earle. This is a very eclectic play, which is a nicer way of saying it's a WTF play, because I usually like Richard Maxwell plays, and I'm trying to be kinder to him, which at one point this play does exhort. It would have been a lot kinder if they'd given us more comfortable seats. We were sitting on these crates. We were given this little square piece of foam to put underneath us and a little tiny ledge for our feet. So I was in agony. It was 80 minutes, but I felt like it was like a, a half a century. And I, at one point, I was like claustrophobic and panic attacking. When would this ever end? As for the play itself, it is divided into endless scenes. Messenger demands his wages from Cowboy and goes to great lengths to get his pay. He tries to collect a deck from Manon, who lives off the grid with Drunk. Manon and Drunk go on their own journey and meet up with a mother and two her sons, Supervisor and Beast, who always need to be contained. The mom misses culture. Then there is some monologue about a bird, and then there's a story told in dark and fog. But at this point, I just couldn't take it anymore, and I couldn't even focus on words or anything. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. I mean, I usually, I never thought I'd be in a position to give a bad review to Richard Maxwell. I like his deadpan sensibilities and sly humor, but I found none of that here. However, 
I did like Steve Earle's music played on an Oolian pipe by Evan Goff and chimey percussion by Anna Ray. Also, it was great seeing Viney Burroughs commanding the stage. She's like really like, like 98 or something. She's oh. brilliant. I mean, she's like a, an institution. It was so cool to see her. And there were a lot of downtown actors and writers and familiar faces that you might get a kick out of seeing on stage. And Jasper Newell, at just 14, he should be commended. And he's going to be, uh, we're going to see a lot of him in the future. So I'm giving it an unhappy face, a happy kind of for the actor music, but I'm sorry. It maybe was in a more comfortable seating. I might have enjoyed it more. Casablanca Box set here, written by Sarah Farrington and directed by Reed Farrington, re-examines the classic Bogart um, and Ingrid Bergman film from the 40s, Casablanca, um, by having actors who are not really suited for the roles playing the parts. And we see the film sort of projected on them or behind them at different points. It seems very busy to me, and I don't think that seeing the movie images contributes to these characters' performances. It just makes us want to see the movie again. But what I would have liked more of is all the backstage shenanigans and the problems of the production, because that was genuinely interesting. And I think that they really brought out well. Yeah, I, 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 again, this is a, I agree. I agree. The stars again. were aligned. Yeah, and, <laughs> and like like Richard Maxwell, I love the Farringtons, and I'm like I was surprised at how much I disliked this because I just think they did not cast. I mean, it's one thing to cast against type, but in this case, it's just you can't take an iconic figure like Bogey and cast him a certain way. It just doesn't work. Especially when you're showing the image. It might work if you didn't have no, all that no, busyness no, with no, the No, it filming. never works. It happened okay. with, uh, the same thing with James Coburn, and I had trouble with that one, too. Uh, but we both enjoyed the squabbling writers and mm. showing the various strange endings of Casablanca was the most interesting to me. And I didn't realize there was a female writer in the mix. I also enjoyed Mayo Methos, Alcoholic Jealous Interruptions. That was <laughs> Bogey's wife before Bacall. And they were known as the Bally Bogarts. And I had read her book, Bogey and Me, so I knew about her. This might be fun for film buffs, even though it is a bit disappointing. It just felt out of sync. And I'm still looking forward to the next Farrington project, project because I really like the Farringtons. This one just, just was off. It just missed. Yeah, it seemed a little bit too overheated. <laughs> but I, I'll give it a, mi a mix because there were some elements that I liked. We agree. Yes, amazing. Scott Siegel has some great things coming up at Town Hall, including on May 1st, Broadway Unplugged, where you have a whole concert of songs sung by wonderful Tony Storrs, Tony nominees, and other great performers without any amplification. And then later in the month, I think it's May 22nd, yeah. Broadway by the Year, where you know one decade will be examined and great performers singing great Broadway songs. To prepare for this, I was lucky enough to go to um, an event at the Metropolitan Room, which was a benefit party for Broadway Unplugged, and performers included Liam, Leanne M. Dobbs, who's the most beautiful, perfect ingenue for singing 30s and 40s type songs, Christine Lavin, who is the funniest songwriter. She did a thing about if you're drunk, please don't buy a puppy, and about <laughs> all her crazy passwords that are now confused. Douglas Ladner, perfect. Matinee star, great voice, very sexy. Julianne Lewis, Casey Sheik, and Morgan Weed. And just at the Metropolitan, I love what Scott does at the Town Hall, but it's so much more intimate at the Metropolitan Room. You're so much closer. And you could get great drinks like I had a chocolate martini. So I was in heaven. But you will be in heaven too if you go on May 1st to see Broadway Unplugged. I saw a version of Mary Harriet Nymph ages ago. And now, ta-da, it's going to be at the York. You can see it now. And I got a chance to talk to Bill Castellino, the director, and the creative team of Jennifer Robbins, Michael Biello, and Dan Martin. And these were the musical numbers that I got to listen to. The village voice of these magical people that turn into all sorts of different things. And these were the numbers and the people who sang them. 
Bill Castellino. So, Cagney, another show closes, and Mary Harry, another show opens. I'm very blessed. They're going to both be running simultaneously through all of May. So, Cagney closes the 28th, and we open May 4th. So, I get, I get a month of a double feature. So, tell us about Mary Harry. Wonderful show. It's romantic. It's Italian. It's New York. It is magical. It takes place in the East Village where all kinds of wonderful, fantastical things can happen. It's full of walls coming to life and angels singing and people falling in love and growing up and lots of food. Um, is it? If you're in love, ever have been or ever plan to be, I suggest Mary Harry. Also, if you're hungry, there's food on stage. Do we get to eat any of it? No, but you smell a little, I bet. So you should be well fed before you go see the Biscotti. Remember that word. I journey because you make something and you don't really see it until uh, until it's up on stage and then you think of all these possibilities of how it could maybe be improved a little bit so and we we like working with each other don't we we yes. do <laughs> well, it's been a very very uh, we've had we've been we've worked really hard on it we've had many and when since bill came involved as the director our new director we've been we've kind of <laughs> done many many uh, different uh, revisions and refinements and stuff so it's uh, it's been about from the beginning maybe eight years so it was your idea to begin with began yeah, with a, a, something I had done with my son actually a long time ago a movie that we had written that we decided wasn't going to be a movie but maybe could be a musical did he want to be a chef and you owned a restaurant or just no, no it was it wasn't it, you know I guess we all bring ourselves into whatever we do but it wasn't autobiographical in that sense at all, but I do have a family that's involved in family businesses, so I know something about that on a very personal level. And my, I found that restaurants are always great material. <laughs> And I do have a family cooking. My mother had a cooking school in New York. My whole and she wrote many cookbooks, and so that area in, always interests me, as it does Dan and Michael. I really love Lydia Bastianich. We have her cookbooks, and she's like a real person that inspires us. Um, so, in the part where little Harry is, we wanted Harry to sort of have a mother mother figure in it because there's no his mom left when he was a baby. Um, so Lydia becomes a 
muse. Um, yeah, a muse for him to kind of create his dream and be his dream and go move toward that in his life. Sure. I mean, you know, when you when you write a show, you're influenced by, or when you're a composer, you're just you're influenced by a lot of stuff. You know, like I I grew up on Rodgers and Hammerstein, and I you know admire Maury Yeston and Sondheim, and I love rock music, and I love kind of classical music. So you know, I try to bring a little bit of everything that inspires me into into the project to serve the story, you know, to serve the story. And with the village, oh. just add though, in terms of the types of music, I mean, we almost go from rap <laughs> to beautiful ballads to very quirky, up, you know, very upbeat things. I mean, it's a, it's, there's really an enormous amount of variety that they have brought in the score. And with the village, sorry, and with the village voice, you have like you can do something like fantastical, and 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 you and you can really let your imagination go with lyrics and everything. Yeah, it just gives me permission to to write poetry and slam and just play with words in a different way, and they're able to take that because it's from a it's from a make believe place, away from the the main four characters in the piece. So that's been fun for me. I mean, I love them. <laughs> There's a part of it that the story from the beginning has always been a love story between the uptown girl and the downtown man, and that's stay, that's there, but the way we're telling the story this time is different. That's what's really different about it, and that's where the village voices come in. It's it's a love a, story about families, yeah, family. about, you know, the parents and learning how to let go and leave and not cut, you know, it's, it's a very much of a, it's love story on many How to transcend a happy marriage is part mythology, fairy tale, and Greek mathematics. Close couple friends are having a lovely little get together and shooting the breeze when Jane mentions this temp Pip, who apparently is in a Polly Morris relationship with two guys, and also she slaughters her own meat and eats every part of it. Naturally, this fascinates the group, and they invite her over, and this sets off a series of events that have life-changing consequences. I love Sarah Rule's plays. They are always so unexpected, but I always cry at some point as she makes some profound point. The sensational cast brings believability to an improbable situation, which makes it more real and keeps your attention to find out how can this all be resolved. Friendships, parenthood, love and sex is all examined within the confines of relationship and marriage. Also, maybe there's a good idea to stay away from drugs. This play may transcend the way you think about a lot of things and not just marriage. I give this a happy face. We just came from Stephen McCaslin's production of uh, Mademoiselle Colombe, which is one of his sort of like revisions of um, unseen musicals and this was from an ennui play and I enjoyed it quite a lot. It's a story about uh, a woman who felt trapped in a marriage to a legionnaire but 
discovered herself and her life when she was performing with his diva mother in backstage life in Paris in the 19th century. Coming up May 2nd is Nick and Nora, which should be a real treat. So for Stephen McHasland and his productions, big happy face. And don't forget longer reviews and Twitter on Facebook page. And I cut Jennifer off. She was saying it, that hey, Mary Harry is a love story on many levels. And sorry for the shaky review. We were at a subway, which is where we fit, did those reviews. If you like sweet, romantic Broadway shows, go see Amelie. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but it's just so delightful. And Broadway Unplugged, May 1st at Town Hall. There's always great. Lucy Lortel Awards are going to be the Skirr Bowl May 7th. And I'm going to go to an evening with John Lisko, April 30th at the Sheen Center. He's like one of my favorite actors, and he's just so delightful. I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. And Encores is back with the Golden Apples, May 10th through 14th. It's a lazy afternoon. Hoping to see Novelli's War at New Victory. Nick and Nora, May 2nd, 7 and 9.30 at 54 Below. And Cheater's going to be back at Cafe Carlisle. And Diane Weist is in Happy Days at Theater for a New Audience. And uh, Mark seeing Mobile Units 12th uh, night, and it's free. David Greenspan is doing Morning Becomes Electra, Eugene O'Neill. It's like the seven-hour play he's doing all by himself. Lyrics and Lyricists is back at 92nd Street Y with Unsung Lyricists, May 6th through 8th. A Handman's Tale with Elizabeth Moss is going on May 10th. And um, Theater of the New City has got two by DePore, Mein Kampf, and Jubilee. And at here you have Edward Einhorn's The Marriage of Alice B. Toklas by Gertrude Stein. At the Brick is the best title I've ever heard. Pluto, no longer a play. I think that's funny. 59 59th Street, J.R. Priestley's The Roundabout, Angels and Echoes, Fossils, La Mama has wonderful stuff, and coming up is Karen Finley there, and Coffee House Chronicles, John Vaccaro in the Playhouse of the Ridiculous, and Penny Arcade is going to be the moderator. At Band, George Takai is going to be May 1st, and the Dreyfus Affair, I've always been fascinated with the Alfred Dreyfus case, it's going on all at Band. Entertain Mr. Sloan at the Wild Project. At the Pershing Center, you have a couple of plays, The Antipodes and Venus. Lincoln Center, Oswald is back at the Bigger Theater. Pacific Overt is a classic stage company. And some plays that we talked about that are now closed. And don't forget to pick up your performing arts inside of the Cultural Heartbeat of New York City. Next show is May 13th. 